Since the collapse of Daesh in 2019, an estimated 1,000 European women and children have been abandoned by their governments in detention camps in northeast Syria. The United Nations and other human rights organizations have called on governments to take back their citizens. So why is the UK government hesitant to do so? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. Around 50,000 people worldwide are thought to have heeded the call of Daesh to join its caliphates in Syria and Iraq between 2011 and 2016. The recruitment drive also attracted women, many of them bringing along children to the region. Others were born into the caliphates to European parents. With the collapse of the caliphate, many are languishing in inhumane and life-threatening camps. 230 women and 640 children from Europe are stuck at the al Hol camp. An EU internal document claims the camps could create a new hotbed of Islamist extremist violence and could pose a threat not only in the region but also to the EU. In one high-profile case, Shamima Begum was stripped of her British citizenship for running away and joining Daesh. Campaigners say she was 15 at the time and was groomed online to travel to Syria. She, like many other women, lured to Syria, had children with extremists. All three of Shamima's children have died. Well, the UK government is unapologetic for stripping her of her citizenship and has refused to repatriate other women and children. So whose responsibility are they? Well, let's find out. Joining me from Helsinki, Yussi Tanner, Finnish ambassador and special envoy with the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. From London, Chris Doyle, director at the Council for Arab-British Understanding. Maya Foa is the Joint Executive Director at Reprieve and Tasnima Kunji, Criminal Defence Solicitor. Welcome uh, to you all to this edition of Roundtable. Let me start with you, UC Tanner. Now, I know you can't speak to the UK government's decisions uh, in, these, in these cases, but you can speak to what the Finnish government is doing in this regard. Uh, you, I understand, have worked to try and bring Finnish women and their children back to Finland. Just tell me a little bit about that process. Yeah, so as, as you said, I can indeed talk only about the Finnish policy and, and, and our legal background and every country, certainly in Europe and, and, and outside Europe as well, as, as well, has its own legal basis and its own political reality as well. So it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an extremely difficult issue. It's been a highly sensitive and, and, and also operationally difficult issue to, to, uh, uh, to undertake and comp complete. Uh, but we have, uh, um, since 2019, uh, repatriated um, 35 individuals uh, out of approximately 45 uh, originally. Um, everybody, all the children, I should say, that, that we have been able to. Uh, and uh, we have a fairly binding constitutional obligation uh, to ensure the fundamental rights of children, and that's that's really been the, uh, the 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 heart of our mission. Now we don't have a representative of the UK government here, but uh, a UK government spokesman has said this: their priority is to ensure the safety and security of the United Kingdom. Those who remain in the conflict zone include some of the most dangerous individuals choosing to stay and fight or otherwise support Daesh. Daesh still remains our most significant terrorist threat at home and abroad. Now, that's the UK government's view, and, and certainly there have been experiences, uh, there has been statements in the press, they're very worried about uh, bringing these uh, uh, threats back to the UK. It's not something that many in the, the UK public would support. How, uh, you see, Tanner, has the, the Finnish public reacted to bringing these women and children home? Is there not a concern that uh, that these women and their children could pose some kind of threat? 
Well, uh, it's a key question, obviously, and there are extremely uh, uh, well-placed and legitimate security concerns involved. Uh, one should not underestimate those. However, uh, uh, one must look at each and every uh, uh, individual case on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, quite different from each other, and you have to look into the, the concrete details of, of each individual, particularly the adult individuals. Uh, so that's what we have tried to do, and, and, and we have tried to uh, do a thorough security assessment of each individual, and, and the result so far has been that, uh, in, in our opinion, in our determination, they haven't uh, posed uh, the kind of risk that would have warranted leaving them and their children in the camps. OK, well, that's the determination of the Finnish government there. Uh, let me turn now uh, to you, Maya Foa. Now, I understand that you have been to these camps. Just outline for us the kind of conditions that these women and children are being held in and why this is a priority. Why should governments be bringing these w women and children home if many of them have refused to denounce uh, Daesh? Absolutely. So the first thing I just want to capture here is we are talking about detention facilities with, yes, tens of thousands of women, but the majority of the detainees, and they are detained, are children. And the majority among the children are under 10 years old. So that's the case with the British families. We have 15 to 20 British families in uh, Camp Raj in northeast Syria. They're detained there. The majority within that number, that group, are children under 10. So now detention, indefinite detention in conditions which I'll describe but which are clearly inhumane of children is surely not something that one, it upholds British standards of fairness, justice, dignity, human rights, and two, certainly isn't in our national security interests. If anything, it's going to create problems down the line quite apart from being a, a moral disgrace um, and a matter of just the most deep inhumanity. And I say that in part because of the statement from the government that these are some of the most dangerous. If the majority of the detainees who are British are children under 10, that does not strike me as a security threat to bring those families home. OK, well, we, we don't have anyone from the British government here to explain why these children under 10 are a, a particular security threat. I'm certainly not privy to that uh, knowledge. But like I say, you've been in the camps. Uh, just tell us why you feel there is an urgency to get these kids out of there. Well, so many of them have been there now for three years or so. And if you imagine a young child there, they don't have proper access to education. They don't have proper access to health care. They don't have proper access to psychosocial services. Many of them have experienced extreme hardship and trauma. I was on my last visit. I met with a, a woman who brought her child out to see me and her child was very, very skinny. Um, and she was asking me for some advice on this kid. And, and I asked about her and the reason she was so skinny, so small, was that she was malnourished in the first place, but also didn't like eating. She didn't like eating because her teeth, they don't have the minimum of dental care. Her teeth were so bad that every mouthful was pain for her. This child, this seven-year-old, also has suicidal thoughts. She talks about killing herself. How we can be leaving those families in those conditions when we have the option to bring them home, as the Finnish government has done, as the German government is doing, as other countries have done, is really beyond me. OK, let, let me turn now to yourself, uh, Tasneem Akunji. Now, now, you certainly have particular insights into what is happening in these camps and how it's impacting children, because you are uh, the legal representative for the family of Shamima Begum, uh, the erstwhile British national who lost three of her own children uh, in those camps. Just for, for, for viewers, just, just reminds, reminds our viewers about this, about the conditions that these kids were in and, and, and why Shamima's children died. Well, <clears throat> Shamima Begum had two children who were three and nine months, I believe, before she actually entered uh, the camp back in 2018, 2019. Um, those children, those two children had died and she'd entered the camp when she was heavily pregnant with her third child. 
and they died from malnutrition and disease um, because of the lack of provision that was available in Syria generally, but that was outside of the camps. Now, in full view of you know international media, she she gave birth to her third child, Jarrah, um, and we at that time wrote to Sajid Javed requesting that they don't stand in our way, <clears throat> because Jarrah was a British citizen, there was no doubt about that, and the conditions in those camps are so bad that we feared, and we put this in writing, we feared for his safety and his ability to survive those conditions. You know, tragically, within two weeks of that, we got a negative response from the Home Secretary, and Jared himself then died having succumbed to pneumonia in those camps. There, there simply wasn't a medical provision, very basic antibiotics that could have been provided to him, and they simply couldn't be provided to him in time. Now, at that time, it was said by our Home Secretary that it was too dangerous to send any uh, government officials over to that camp. This is despite the fact that six different British journalists, some of which were from the BBC themselves, had actually visited her with no problem with security to their own health. I'd attempted to visit her as well uh, at Al Raj with no problem with security. And even now, three years down the line, when there's been issues of some children being repatriated at the behest of Dominic Rabb, um, they still are maintaining this line that, uh, that it's too dangerous to go over there. And, uh, and repatriate children when they've already done so themselves on small occasion and only when the tabloid media have gotten behind the plight of children. So it seems that the, there is no coherent policy decision uh, apart from the general position to leave these people out there to suffer, these children, apart from when uh, you have tabloid media getting behind a child and suddenly the British government's policy suddenly falls into line with its uh, treaty, its obligations under the UN Convention for the Rights of Children. It seems that, you know, if the Daily Mail says that a child is worth saving, all of a sudden that treaty kicks in with the British government, otherwise not. Is it just the children who are the victims here, though? No, of course not. I mean, th there are a, a range of different people out there, and it has to be said some of those people pose a security risk. But you cannot apply a blanket provision, as the British government have done, without assessing the risk of each and every adult individual, and of course children, in terms of posing a risk. Well, given that we have a mature security service in MI5, MI6, GCHQ, as well as a very highly developed um, counterterrorism policing scheme, we, we cannot, as a mature nation, the fifth largest economy in the world, say that we cannot deal with the security risk posed by five, six, seven-year-old children. OK, the reason I ask about whether it's just the children uh, who are the victims here, uh, and I'd like our audience at home to take a look at this, is because the, the majority of British women who are currently detained in northeast Syria are victims of trafficking. At least 63% of adult British women have been subjected to sexual and other forms of exploitation and were either under the age of 18 when they travelled and were coerced into travelling, and or they were kept and moved within Syria against their will. Almost half, at least 45% of British nationals were children when they travelled to Syria, and at least 44% of British women were coerced by a male partner or a relative. I return to you, uh, Tasnima Kunje, because when Shamima went out to Syria, it was claimed that she had been groomed. Yes, um, she and her cohort had been groomed as children. And the law in the UK, the domestic law, is very clear about this, um, as well as our international treaty obligations, which come under what's known as the Palermo Protocols, the Council of, of Europe Treaty Series 197. Now, that puts positive duties on the host nation, the, the country of residence or nationality for these children who've been trafficked. And it forces them to make every provision possible to have their repatriation and their health and their lives themselves protected. Now we've, as a nation, have done the exact opposite of that. We've completely flown in the face of our treaty obligations, flown in the face of our domestic um, law. And we have a government who's simply pretending that everybody who's in this area uh, called Syria with a British passport is somehow a, a threat without ever detailing in any, in any way whatsoever uh, how they have specified a threat 
and what sort of threat children may and, and young women who've been trafficked pose. Now, that is a complete dereliction of our duties, utterly okay. and savagely. OK, uh, Chris Doyle, I see you nodding uh, along there to this. Uh, just give us a sense of uh, what, what the repercussions of this could be if we have this group of women and children, some who can prove that they were trafficked, uh, who can prove that their children aren't a threat and they're being left in these camps. The UK government and other governments may have washed their hands of the whole situation. What happens in that kind of situation? This is not going to resolve itself, is it? Absolutely not. And you've heard very articulately the human, humanitarian and legal reasons why this shouldn't be happening. But there is actually also a very clear security reason for it. So the government's you know, nominal reason for this is that they represent a security threat, whether children or, or adults. But actually, if you leave uh, these people in these camps, vulnerable to being groomed to further uh, becoming extremists, going down that path, then the threat does not just remain in Syria and Iraq. And we've seen this time and time again. We cannot be complacent and imagine that these camps will somehow not become or represent a threat to, to us in Europe. And we've seen the whole history of Daesh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, where camps have actually served as a massive recruiting ground and networking, whether, for example, it was Camp Bukhar. I mean, the, uh, the, the former uh, head of ISIS, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, was uh, actually in detention in Iraq, as was indeed the, the, the head of um, Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, the Al-Qaeda, what once was the Al-Qaeda branch in Syria. So these camps, these prisons have served really as a massive recruiting ground and training ground for such groups. Now, in Iraq and in Syria, they do not have the capabilities to uh, protect these camps, to ensure that people aren't being recruited. The Syrian defense, uh, the Kurdish forces there, the SDF, simply do not have those capabilities. And it's quite possible that there will be a breakout from these camps. Uh, we've seen this in the past, even in January, uh, a significant breakout in Hasake. This is exactly what Daesh has done in the past, back in 2013, 2013 in particular. So we expect this to happen. Britain, along with other countries, can play their role by taking back some of these uh, people determined properly through a proper assessment of any of them do actually represent a threat. And we have the capabilities of ensuring that they don't, you know, represent a threat in, in, in the UK itself. So it's a nonsense, I fear, for domestic political reasons that the British government is appealing to uh, a, a domestic backyard that is increasingly Islamophobic. Uh, they've seen some attacks in Britain, of course, but there is this tr trend to lump all Muslims together, all as a threat. And this government, I'm afraid, has played into that. And also, it's sort of related to the very hostile attitude the British government has to immigrants and refugees. Now, these aren't immigrants and refugees. Of course, they're UK nationals. But they're applying the same sorts of attitudes to them that sees our government now want to process asylum seekers in Rwanda. It's almost as if they are not really British anymore. We're going to deprive them of nationality. It's not our problem. And we're not uh, either owning up to our own uh, legal responsibilities, but also our security responsibilities, because in the long run, this could come back to bite us. Yeah, well, well, quite. And, and Chris Doyle, if I could just stay with you, because that point you raise about leaving the situation to continue and to fester uh, certainly has been picked up by the United States in particular. Uh, they are very keen uh, to ensure that uh, countries take their nationals back. Do you think this is the potential to be a point of tension uh, between the United States and the UK when it comes to this? Or is there very much a hope that this is out of sight, out of mind, uh, uh, and uh, the, the UK government is, is hoping that people will concern themselves with other uh, challenges that they're facing and, and this will just go away? 
my fear is that it'll actually take a massive breakout from these camps when we see some quite dangerous individuals who escape from these camps as well as others who are perhaps not. And then it will become a real issue of tension at that point between the United States and other governments and the UK, those countries who haven't uh, done their share. Uh, I think then we'll have a, a, a serious problem. And it's just a matter of time. I mean, we are seeing already in, in Syria an uptick in Daesh attacks. Uh, they are regrouping. They're certainly not defeated. We, I think we were complacent about that. And the way in which we have left these camps to fester is really a part of that very complacent attitude that we have, both to security, but also humanitarian and legal issues. Okay, you see it, Tanner, uh, certainly the Finnish government uh, appears to have taken this seriously. The Finnish government is wanting to look after its citizens. Is there a frustration that, that other nations aren't following in your footsteps? Well, again, I mean, uh, this is completely a, a national competence and depends on the particular legal framework that each and every government has. But for us, certainly what Mr. Doyle said uh, is something that, that, that we, ha we, we very much agree upon, namely the fact that there are consequences to inaction also. I mean, the longer the children particularly remain in, remain in those camps, the harder it will be to counter violent extremism and radicalization. So, so there, there are security implications also uh, involved with not doing anything, and that's part of our security assessment and part of the background why we have, we have decided to repatriate the children as quickly as possible. And there has been no pushback in Finland. I mean, it, it, there is the security aspect, but there is also the domestic aspect. And, and the UK government, from what uh, Chris Doyle was saying, appears to be led by uh, domestic public opinion on this. Is there not that calculation in Finland as well? Or do you see the security aspects uh, outweighing uh, whatever upheaval this could cause at home? Well, that's an excellent question. I mean, certainly, when we began the repatriations in late 2019, there was quite a bit of a, a domestic fallout. It was a very sensitive, very toxic debate domestically, as it has been everywhere where this issue has been on the table. Um, Progressively, as we started to repatriate, and, and particularly after we repatriated also adult women, and then explained publicly uh, the reasons and the security assessments, assessments behind those repatriations, uh, the public reaction became clearly much more muted. And at the moment, uh, it isn't really an issue anymore, I don't think. Okay, uh, let me come to you now, Amaya Foa, because like it or not, this is a toxic debate. It can be a toxic debate when politics inevitably gets involved, but there's also the legal debate as well. There are also legal considerations. I mean, what happens if a, a government just sidesteps its international uh, legal considerations? Where do groups like yours go from there? Yeah, it's a great question. So we are working with the legal teams who represent all of the women who are detained and children detained in northeast Syria. Um, and of course, there are some legal challenges that are being pursued. But an additional hurdle that we now have is that the British government, in seeking to push away its obligations, in seeking to really just exile this group of individuals, they have stripped them of their citizenship. So we have trafficking cases, we have citizenship cases, and we have arguments about repatriation. They're all different legal challenges, but the law alone isn't going to win the day. We need also the political movement, and we need a change in terms of the media narrative. So from Reprieve's perspective, this is why we work so closely with politicians, why we work closely with journalists who we trust, and why we also then pursue the, the legal appeals. And are you getting, uh, Maya Four? Are you, are, are, do, you, do you feel like you're breaking through to politicians when you discuss this? Because as I speak in the, the, the latest Queen's speech, we have these uh, bills going through that would uh, certainly announce that it would make it easier to strip someone of their citizen, citizenship without them even knowing about it. Do you feel that you're making the case effectively? Well, I've actually been really heartened by some of the politicians on this issue. There is an all-party parliamentary group on trafficked Britons in Syria, which was formed about a year ago, and they've just finished an inquiry which found that, as you mentioned earlier, 
uh, a large majority of the Brits who are out there may be victims of trafficking. They also said that it's in our security interests to bring these British families back, as you've heard. And these include, you know, uh, conservative MPs, former cabinet ministers. We have Andrew Mitchell MP. We have David Davis. We have Tobias Elwood, uh, Saeed Avasi. There are lots of people with huge amounts of credibility within government who, from a range of different parties, from a range of different perspectives, who are all saying the same thing, which is that the government needs to change its position, do the sensible and humane and legal and responsible thing and bring this relatively small number of British families home. Well, we'll have to leave it there on that positive note. Uh, thank you very much indeed. We are out of time, but it has been a fascinating discussion. I want to thank all my uh, panellists, uh, UC Tanner, Chris Doyle, Maya Foa, and Tasneem Okunji. And thank you too for watching. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search Roundtable TRT World. Now for me and the whole team here, it's goodbye and thank you for watching.